With us today, we have a distinguished African known for his emphasis on good governance in Africa, integrity, and African aspirations to be better than it is today. We have with us in the studio, Professor Pierlo Lumumba. Professor Lumumba is a distinguished African who has spent a lifetime in the struggle for good governance on the continent. Welcome, Professor. Thank you. It's been a pleasure Thank you meeting you. Thank you very much you. for inviting me to this. Also with me in the studio is another person who also has, interestingly, had a stint with the great issue of governance and integrity, especially in the private sector in Nigeria. He's the founder of ProShare, Mr. Olufemi Aoyemi. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure meeting you. Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Aoyemi, your history on governance and integrity in Nigeria is well known. So I'm going to give you the advantage of kicking off this session by asking Prof some of those things that have agitated your mind concerning Africa. Okay, so Prof, um, welcome to Nigeria, not for the first time. Um, first, I must confess to you that I've never been one of those who straight off the bat were always on the right side of the conversation about governance, about the conversations about integrity, and most importantly about development. Mm -hmm. I've had to walk my way. So I come with that humility mm -hmm. to ask you, having been inspired by you mm -hmm. in terms of what you do, to ask, is there optimism for the generation coming after us to look for in Africa, given all you see? I must first of all say that we must never lose hope. And when I look at the continent of Africa, I see hope. Mm. I see uh, that in this very cloudy environment, there is a silver lining. But it's important at the very outset to warn ourselves. Those who define Africa from outside of the continent normally refer to Africa as if she was one country like Canada, mm -hmm. like the United States of America. But let us remind ourselves that when we talk about Africa, we are talking about a continent that was rudely divided into several countries according to European spheres of influence. As we speak now, there are 54 officially recognized African countries. I'm excluding the Arab Republic of Sahrawi over which Morocco has a claim, and I'm also excluding Ambazonia, which is waging its war against La République of Cameroon. Having warned myself about those realities, <laughs> I then must come to the question that you've posed. The oldest country in Africa as a post-colonial state is Ghana. But we must also remind ourselves that Ethiopia was not successfully colonized. We must remind ourselves li that Liberia attained or regained our independence in 1847. And having warned ourselves, we must also warn ourselves again. This evening we are warning ourselves <laughs> that several European countries colonized Africa with different traditions. The Portuguese were here, the British were here, the French were here, the Italians were here, the Germans were here until they were kicked out after the war, the Spaniards were here. So that we have countries in Africa which were created in the image of European mm. colonial powers. In the image of these colonizers who saw these countries as outposts where they could gain their economic dividends. Having warned ourselves of those realities and truisms which can be proven through history, we are now talking about the post-colonial African state. And my own view is that the post-colonial African state was actually constructed to fail. The colonial powers intended that upon their departure, the colonies would fail. The French thought that their colonies would fail as long as they did not follow what Paris declared. 
The Belgians thought that Congo would fail. The British thought that their colonies would fail. That is why on the eve of independence, country sections of Nigeria, for example, which were administered separately, were suddenly put together, incompatible, they thought, in a manner that they would collapse. South Sudan and the Sudan. So when you want to talk about hope in Africa, you must ask yourself, what was the intention of the colonizers who crafted these states and put different African nations together? But post-independence, one sees countries that have been struggling to ensure that they make the best of the situation. They were given lemons in a manner of speaking and they have been trying to make lemonades with varying degrees of success. The history of the post colonial African state has been mixed. You will remember in the early 1960s, we had coup d'etats. In fact, the very first coup d'etat was in 1960, when they killed uh, Silvanus Olympio in Togo. So soon after that, we saw what happened in Mali, what happened in Ghana, what happened in Nigeria, what happened in Niger, you know, and one can go on and on. So that there was that period when people were actually nostalgic about the past. They even said it was better that we had remained colonized. Right. Then there was the period when the coup makers themselves came and said, we are going to change all that. But little did we realize that at all critical moments, the invisible hands of the erstwhile colonizers was always present, manipulating African leaders who were doing their bidding. So that we have a continent where there are people who think that the continent cannot achieve anything. Yet they don't recognize that all these are choreographed from outside to ensure that the neo-colonial state continues to perform the functions of the colonial state as some observers have put it very well, they gave us the crown but remained with the jewels. How does that, uh, what you just said, yes. given the current conversation, yes. which is not a new conversation, yes. about how the French government have uh, been able to manage its French colonies with a, with, a, with, a, with a currency, with the conditions around which they give independence, that appears to be consistent. But here yeah. is the, the classical school of thought that says that should anything happen to that, it will create instability, as we saw in what happened to Libya, for example. So how, how do we therefore reconcile the fact that one, contextually, what you've placed here mm -hmm. makes more sense, mm -hmm. and it is well captured in what we see, mm -hmm. if not apparent with the British colonized environment or the apartheid regime, mm -hmm. but we see it clearly with the French, whereby they were straight up from, and they even wrote it down in documents, oh, yeah. how it works. You know, you know, I hear you, and I hear you very loudly, and I'll come to the French question, because I want also to be faithful to the question that you pose. I've given a rather longish historical context, but I want to reiterate that in the face of all these apparent problems, you've seen that the African states have always tried to remain true to what was their declared agenda. Mm. So that a struggling Ghana that goes through coup d'etats still keeps on repeating that the mandate that we have from our people is to ensure that we improve the quality of their lives in agriculture, in education, in health, and in manufacturing. Do they achieve it? Sometimes they don't. Many times they don't because we see that the quality of the people's lives does not always grow as fast as we would desire. And it is not only in Ghana, it is to be found in Senegal and in different places. But one must remind oneself that the African state if you are to give the analogy of a plane, is a plane that is always flying against very heavy headwinds, mm -hmm. which are managed and choreographed from outside of the continent. That is not to say that we do not have our own internal contradictions which help the process. But that notwithstanding, the reason for my optimism is that people know what is right. They may not be working towards it as consciously and as consistently as they should,
But the truth is that you see in different countries, efforts have always been made. And one can cite different examples. And the examples that I want to cite, look at the way African countries were moving in the 1960s. I know that the GDP is not a measure that one wants to use to define how countries are growing. Well, yes. But you can see that in the early 1960s when we were looking at the indices, whether it was in health, whether it was in agriculture, whether it was in education, some very useful strides were made. These were then disrupted through the structural adjustment programs introduced by the World Bank and the Bretton Woods Institution generally. And then this brings me to the question that you posed, which is, how do you account for all these in the context of what we see and are able to demonstrate factually by colonial powers such as France? Let us remind ourselves, did the colonizer choose to leave because it was convenient to leave? Or did the colonizer leave because after the World War II, which was actually a, essentially a European tribal war into which we were all incorporated, did they leave because they wanted to do when the resolution for independence was made in 1960 by the UN? No. Countries such as France, no. And knew even then that the quality of life that was being enjoyed by the French was fed from Africa. And that is why when they were leaving, they created an environment that will ensure that they continue to derive dividends from their former colonies. Aside from Guinea, under Seko Toure, mm -hmm. and Mali under Modibo Keita, all the other countries agreed, number one, that you, the French, are still going to control our affairs. You are going to control our currency, and that reigns up to today. The net effect, therefore, is that when we talk about neocolonization as one of the things that stands in the way of African prosperity, we are not saying it merely because this is an academic exercise. This is the reality on the ground. And indeed, when we talk about uh, neocolonization and we refer to the former Portuguese colonies, if you look at the former Portuguese colonies of Mozambique, Angola, Cape Verde, and Guinea-Bissau, you can still see the subtle hand of Portugal trying to choreograph and to manipulate affairs. Even the British who enjoy indirect rule, there are many ways in, still, in which they still continue to manipulate process. The Belgians in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and one can go on and on. If you look at countries like Zimbabwe, and when I talk about Zimbabwe, I talk about the land question, which I've described elsewhere as the last colonial question. We know that 80% of the land in Zimbabwe until Mugabe intervened was controlled by a small population of whites. We know that land is the last colonial question in post-apartheid South Africa. So in a nutshell, what one is saying that the optimism must remain alive and well because Africans recognize that the decolonization process did not end when we adopted national anthems. It did not end when we had flags. It did not end when we had heads of state. It did not end when we have elections which brought into power people with black faces, that indeed it was the beginning of the process of fighting for the things that we promised ourselves once we had sent away the colonizer. So here's my concern. Yes. And this is very, um, uh, it's humbling for me. Mm -hmm. One is listening to you, mm -hmm. I see the issue that I cannot find any other geographical space 50 years after independence, still fo focusing on the colonizers as a factor for their own underdevelopment. Mm. I'm looking at the things which were signed. Then there's the economic reality, mm. whereby the economic entities in Africa do not even trade amongst themselves. And everything has to go through an European country, an American country, and now a Chinese entity. And the last thing which you mentioned is land. That becomes a critical, that is the only 
collateral that yeah. Africans have. That is also being debased right now because for every investment coming in, they either take your land to produce agricultural products to feed their people, or they take their land to give infrastructure for which their controls in there. It then raises the question that challenges my first hypothesis mm -hmm. about the optimism. Mm -hmm. That in a situation where you have the African Union and you have countries operating like, not like confederates really, but they are basically operating on their own, and nothing seems to bind us together. For us in West Africa, we could not find a common agenda around ECOWAS. Mm. And within the African continent, we haven't been able to even move forward with how we want to actualize the after arrangement we make. Taking it all together, and your general principles around this thing, how do we find a pathway forward? L let me look at it in this perspective. There are those who argue that Africans use colonization as an excuse to explain their current plight. Excuses, but the truth is that if you look at the African nation, the post-colonial African nation, mm -hmm. that nation has never succeeded in totally severing the umbilical cord with the colonizing power. And the truth is that Africa continues to receive very condescending and parasitic treatment from the colonizing, the former colonizers. We are the only continent that I know that is still referred to in these condescending terms, Anglophone Africa, Francophone Africa, Lusophone Africa. And we are the only countries, despite preten pretensions to the contrary, that still have our colonizing powers organizing us under organizations that are controlled with headquarters in Paris, controlled with headquarters in the United Kingdom, controlled with headquarters in Lisbon, controlled with headquarters in Brussels. The net effect, therefore, is that the post-colonial African state is always under attack and under assault by the colonizing power. That being the case, the question is, what have we tried to do in that reality, in that space? We have always tried to ensure that we liberate ourselves. And there have been quite a number of efforts, some of them contradictory. Look at the way in which the continental, or rather the colonizing powers have tried to deal with us. When we try to go away, they come up with arguments that ensure that we are still within their sphere of control. You remember the Lomé Convention. In 1975, I think, the Lomé Convention, which was entered into in Lomé, Togo, was African, Caribbean, and Pacific yes. to define how we continue to trade with the colonial powers for their benefit. You remember the Cotonou Convention, which was in Cotonou in Benin in the year 2000, once again, which was an extension of the African, Caribbean, and Pacific. You, after that, Africans themselves decided that we must define what is in our best interest. And in 1980, here in Lagos, African countries came up with the Lagos Plan of Action. And the Lagos Plan of Action was designed to enhance intra-African trade. But the Lagos Plan of Action, which was under the auspices of the Afri Organization of African mm -hmm. Union, did not take off. We now see, in fact, today when I hear the African continental free trade area is a rehash of the Lagos Plan of Action. When I hear of Africa Agenda 2063 is a rehash of the Lagos Plan of Action. But there is it's not only Europe that are doing this. Look at the entire regime of the Africa Growth Opportunities Act, which is a legislation from the United States of America. It is the Americans now, through their own legislature, defining how they want to trade with us. And you can go even beyond that. The General Agreement on Trade and Tariff, GATT, which was then succeeded by the WTO, all these institutions are created from outside of the continent and then brought to us weak economies. African countries are weak economies. They are not united. And I'll give you an example that I love giving. Look at a, a country like Togo, or a country like Sao Tome and Principe, entering into a bilateral relationship with China. Mm 
South Tome and Principe, I don't think their GDP is anywhere near one Less billion United dollars. Absolutely. And it now wants to enter into a bilateral relationship with China, with a population of 1.4 billion, with a GDP, if you may, of nearly 5 trillion United States dollars. It doesn't make sense. But if you want countries in Africa to begin to make economic sense, they must do a number of things. Initially, because the continental arrangements have taken time, we took the view that it would be regional. So that ECOWAS would negotiate certain things as ECOWAS with, yeah, with free trade, free movement of goods and services. And then combine the regionals Absolutely. together. So the regionals, you start with ECOWAS, you go to Central Africa, you go to SADAC, you go to COMESA, you go to East African community, you go to the Maghreb, and then you come to the African continent. But even when we are trying to do that, you can imagine, you can imagine the subterranean maneuvers of the erstwhile colonial powers. Do we know now, as for example, ECOWAS says that they'll have a currency called the ECO by the year 2020. Do we know what the French are telling their former colonies? When we say that we ha want to have a common currency in East Africa, do we know what the British are telling the individual countries? Do we know what the Belgians are telling the Congolese when we say we want to have a Central African Union? We don't know. And because we have been susceptible to manipulation by these earthwide colonial powers, achieving continental harmony becomes that much difficult, which brings me to what I would call as the mother answer to your question. I still hold the view that in this world is still the law of the jungle, is survival of the fittest and the dying of the least suitable. And I'm saying that because the last limb of your question was about China. China is now a rising power. And when I talk about China, during my own lifetime, I've seen China and Chinese goods being associated with low quality about 30 years ago. Right. Today, China is omnipresent. You go to any African country, if they are not building roads, they are building ports. If they are not building sports, they are building stadia. If they are not doing that, they are doing factories. If they are not building factories, they are supplying goods within our own lifetime. And we never talk about it, but India.